Hello, and welcome to today's seminar. My name is Erica, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. We will be taking time to answer your questions today. We encourage you to type and submit your questions during the presentation. To do so, click on the Q&A tab at the top of the webinar window. Click the Submit button to send in your question. To download a copy of today's presentation, navigate to the Materials tab. And if you need assistance at any time, click on the Help tab for our support team's contact information. Great, I think we're ready to begin. Today's FRAC web event is titled Hunger, Poverty, and Health Disparities During COVID-19 and the Federal Nutrition Program's role in an inequitable recovery. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Luis Gradera, President, Food Research and Action Center. Luis, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Erica. And welcome everybody to our webinar. We're so pleased to have you join us. This webinar, will focus on the connections between food insecurity, poverty, and health, and how COVID-19 has exacerbated inequities and the role of the federal nutrition programs in an equitable recovery. Historic and current inequities in the U.S. fuel an unacceptable cycle of poverty, hunger, and poor health. And this will continue unless a wide range of policies are enacted that, priori that prioritize an equitable outcome. New data from USDA and the census showed that the social safety nets, including the federal nutrition programs, helped lessen the pandemic's impact on hunger and poverty in 2020. However, rates of hunger and poverty are still unacceptably high and disparities have increased. Today, we'll be reviewing the new data and exploring these important topics. I'm so pleased we're here today, gathered virtually as a community for this conversation and reflecting on what we have learned during the pandemic and what our policy priorities should be in order to ensure an equitable, long-term recovery and an end to hunger. Next slide, Erica. So uh, you have here our agenda. Uh, I'll next uh, hand it over to Allison Lacco, who will give a brief presentation on, on the current data. And then we'll hear from our excellent panel, uh, Angela Odoms Young, a researcher and associate professor at the Division of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell University, and Alberto Gonzalez, the senior project manager for health and policy at Unidos US. And as uh, mentioned at the, at the beginning, uh, please uh, enter your questions into the Q&A section. And we look forward to the dialogue with you. So uh, now I will hand it over to Allison Lacco, FRAC's Senior Nutrition Policy and Research Analyst. Allison, over to you. Thanks, Luis. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, Erica, next. So my name is Allison. I'm FRAC Senior Nutrition Research and Policy Analyst. I'm going to briefly summarize recent research from USDA and the census that Luis just mentioned, which has measured the impact COVID-19 has had on rates of hunger, poverty, um, and some additional data on COVID's impact on health. Next. Sorry, yeah, okay, great. So um, first, hunger. I'm going to present data from USDA's annual report on food insecurity or when a household has insufficient access to healthy food for all household members at all times throughout the year. So in 2019, about one in 10 households experienced food insecurity and four out of 10 experienced the more severe condition of very low food security, which means that food intake was reduced at multiple points during the year. About 35 million people lived in households that reported food insecurity. Next. So although in 2020, um, there was widespread job loss and disruption to food supply and food access due to COVID-19, there were also a lot of important expansions to the federal assistance programs, which includes the federal nutrition programs. Household food insecurity rates for this reason stayed the same at 
However, the number of people living in households experiencing food insecurity did increase by 3 million people. Next. Um, uh, sorry, next again. There were, there were significant increases in household food insecurity rates in some specific demographic groups. So among households with children, food insecurity rates increased from 13.6 to 14.8% from 2019 to 2020. Next. There were also some disparities that increased by race and ethnicity. So among black households specifically, food insecurity rates increased significantly from 19 to about 22%. Rates also increased among Hispanic households, although they weren't statistically different from 2019. Um, but because there was also a reduction among white households, um, these racial and ethnic disparities actually increased from 2019 to 2020, just showing that um, you know, a rising tide does not necessarily lift all boats. And it's really important to consider this when we're thinking about equitable policy solutions for the recovery. Next. Um, so USDA also looked at food insecurity rates by employment status given the nature of the pandemic. Um, from mid-November to mid-December, the food insecurity rate was 5.7% for all households. For the, so for that 30 day period, but it was significantly higher at 16.4% among households where the head of household reported being unable to work because of uh, you know, loss of business or a closure of business due to the pandemic. Next. On to poverty. Last week, the census released their annual data on income and poverty. So compared to 2019, median household income in 2020 declined by 2.9%. Next. And the official poverty rate increased from 10.5% of people to 11.4% of people, which is an equ equivalent to about 3.3 million people. Next. The census has provided some graphs of income and poverty over time by race and ethnicity, showing that the disparities we have seen, that we see now have been persistent over a long period of time. So this shows median household income. Next. And this one shows um, the same thing, race and ethnicity, but for the official poverty status. Next. The census also calculates something called the supplemental poverty measure. They've been doing this since 2011. This measure is different from the official poverty measure because it accounts for the cost of living and the receipt of government programs. So for the first time in its existence, in its 10 year existence, the SPM is actually lower than the official poverty measure. Next. Um, normally, the cost of living and taxes have outweighed incoming um, resources for, for households, but this year expansions um, actually serve to lower poverty rates in 2020 compared to the official measure. Next. Social security remains the program that lifts by far the most people out of poverty, um, but some of the programs that were particularly impacted by expansions and unique to COVID were, um, you know, the federal nutrition programs, which were estimated to lift 3.2 million people out of poverty. Um, and the stimulus checks, this, this accounts for the first two rounds of stimulus checks in 2020, lifted 11.7 million people out of poverty, and unemployment benefits were estimated to lift 5.5 million people out of poverty. And without the stimulus checks, the supplemental measure would have actually increased um, from 11.8 in 2019 to 12.7 in 2020, but instead we see this decrease. Next. Lastly, health. Um, COVID was the third leading cause of death in 2020, and it continues to be the third leading cause of death to, so far in 2021. The data that I chose to show you here is only through March 2nd, 2021. Um, but the APM Research Lab, where this data comes from, carefully collected data for Indigenous and Pacific Islander peoples as well, who are often rendered invisible in the category other race um, in most data sets. So I felt that this was important to share and just shows the disparities in the likelihood of dying from COVID in the first year of the pandemic. We know that these disparities in deaths have continued. We also know that it just reflects higher rates of contracting COVID in these populations, which has um, implications when we think about long COVID and the long-term health effects of this pandemic felt, being felt disproportionately by marginalized communities. Next. Um, in closing, I just wanted to share a couple of resources that FRAC has. Uh, we recently released a report 
hunger, poverty, and health disparities during COVID, where you can find more information about um, disparities that are relevant to specific subpopulations. While I went over data by race and ethnicity, inequities also exist along lines of gender and class. And this report goes into more detail for different populations. And these two links are where you can find more of our research and data and also um, the Action Center, which has uh, the bills that we're currently supporting, ways that you can get involved and take action. And with that, Luis, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, Allison. That was wonderful. And now I'm very pleased to introduce today's expert and esteemed panel. Uh, first, Dr. Angela Odoms Young, a researcher, a professor in the now the uh, uh, at the Division of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell University, and Alberto Gonzalez, Senior Project Manager for Health Policy at Unidos US. We really appreciate their partnership throughout. Uh, this, this entire effort on planning this webinar and on uh, looking at what all this means uh, for uh, uh, for us who are interested in this and also for people experiencing uh, poverty and hunger. So uh, now what I will do is I will hand it over uh, to Angela Odoms Young. Angela, over to you. Thank you so much, Luis, and thank you to FRAC for inviting me to participate in the webinar. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to talk about the root causes of the racial food insecurity gap. Uh, Allison highlighted the inequities that exist by race. I want to uh, focus my talk on Black populations, but with the lens of understanding that Black populations are not unique uh, to this and really talk about structural violence. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm Angela Williams Young. I'm a faculty member in the Division of Nutritional Sciences uh, uh, at Cornell University and the lead investigator for the Nutrition, Obesity, Health Equity, uh, and Food Justice Research Laboratory. Next slide. So before we get started, uh, because our past informs our present and informs the future, I just wanted to mention that Cornell is located on the traditional lands of the Gaia Coni, uh, which is um, part of the um, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, uh, which is an alliance of six sovereign nations. I think this is important. And even as we talk about the data, as Allison mentioned, and a colleague mentioned on a call recently, that um, deeming populations as invisible is a new form of racism. And so I think it's important to understand how this past informs the future and why some of the populations are absent from the data that we have. Um, next slide, please. So it's important when we think about food insecurity that we understand that it's a multidimensional concept. So when we focus on this increase in food insecurity rates and the disproportionate burden experienced by certain populations, it's not only the experience of what we think of as that physiological effect of hunger, but it's the other impact on the community. It's a social impact where you have a uh, uh, this feeling of deprivation uh, or social exclusion and a deviation from social norms because people can't participate in some of the normal cultural norms that are associated with food, uh, food anxiety or feelings of lack of choice or engaging in that managed process where people need to navigate their environment, including their participation in food assistance programs to make sure that they can make ends meet. Uh, next slide. So I think this is critically important because this disproportionate burden, uh, as was mentioned, is not only happened since COVID, it is persistent. And so the racial food insecurity gap has actually persisted for uh, a, about two decades. So if you look at the uh, graph on the left, this is overall, uh, and the graph on the right is where we look at very low food insecurity. And you see this uh, very significant gap by race and ethnicity. And I know it was mentioned that there are other 
uh, types of indicators like disability status, um, even when we look at gender or uh, family or household structure. But this racial gap in food insecurity is pretty uh, persistent and significant when we think about the burden on some communities as compared to others. Uh, next slide. So the gap in food insecurity, this racial gap in food insecurity is closely linked to the racial wealth gap. And if we look at median wealth for black households as compared to white households, uh, in 2019, the median wealth, and this is without defined benefit pensions of black households in the United States was 24, about $24,000 as compared to 189 thousand dollars for white households and we see this gap widen with aging uh, black wage gaps uh, uh, exist and we see that both we talk about the overarching wealth gap but the wage gaps are wide no matter how you slice the data so many times we think about poverty but this is across all education groups uh, when we look at that gap in wages and uh, when we think about earnings. Uh, next slide. So we can't talk about this racial gap in food insecurity without understanding the root causes and without thinking about this lens of structural racism. And this diagram, which appeared in the recent FRAC report um, developed by Bread for the World, it talks about how these root causes and policies have impacted what we see today when it comes to food insecurity. As I mentioned, this racial wealth gap, we see differences in earnings, overrepresentation of certain populations in poverty, a lack of wealth when it comes to retirement, uh, and also overall wealth savings. But I really want to sort of put us in context and think about the overarching historical perspective. And if you could go to the next slide, please. We can't really think about just what we see. And this is from uh, Johan Galton. It's the triangle of structural violence. And we see direct violence or extractive violence. So we see high rates of food insecurity, poor nutrition and diet related health outcomes, obesity, uh, death and disability that's associated with uh, things like food insecurity, uh, or individual family trauma, or a negative aesthetic. So when we talk about communities and lack of access in communities uh, or lack of investment in communities, these are things that we see. But what's underlying what we see is this concept of structural violence, policies that really look at the distribution of both when we talk about wealth, but also food insecurity and communities. And I want to talk a little bit about some of those policies. So uh, some examples, and I'll talk about some of these uh, in detail, but things like uh, land provision and black land laws, uh, redlining, uh, which also appeared in, and was discussed in the FRAC report. Um, policies around state and community sanctioned violence, uh, policies that are historic that we all are aware of, things like slavery or the black codes, uh, policies that restrict mobility and transferring of wealth. So restricting documents needed for legal transactions or things like birth certificates with a lot of people don't, um, where a lot of people don't realize sort of the historical origin of why wealth may be accumulated in some communities and not in others. And then also cultural violence. So this dehumanization or narratives of ignorance and inferiority or anti-Black racism, which we've talked a lot about this year. And so structural violence highlights the negative consequences of the uneven distribution of power and resources. And to understand these uh, in a broader society is largely avoidable in highly destructive social processes, not only for the communities that are at the dis uh, that are disadvantaged, but society overall. And structural violence is really where we think about the harmful discriminatory societal structures uh, 
And then cultural violence are those uh, things that are reinforced within society to legitimize direct and structural violence. And so although we see food insecurity, we have to think more about what's underlying these, um, these outcomes and then how do we change it? Uh, next slide. So we know the legacy of slavery, and I just want to highlight a few of these and then talk about some potential policies that can address the racial gap uh, or the racial food insecurity gap, uh, and then also the racial wealth gap. So the history of African Americans is really rooted in this idea of dehumanization and anti-Black racism. So we have 200 years, 246 years of slavery, followed by almost a hundred years of legal disenfranchisement and extra legal intimidation. So if you think about this timeline, the time where of actual, what people talk about is freedom or freedom from segregation, we have a small period. So you can't ignore this history. When we think about solutions, we can't just start today. We have to think about what came before. Uh, next slide. In this historic role of race and policy, which creates inequities, I think it's really important in this conversation. So some examples, we talk about the geogra uh, geographic distribution of slavery and mobility of populations. Uh, when we think about the mobility of Blacks within the South, part of this mobility, if we look at the trajectory of Blacks in the South in wages and employment, part of the restriction on geographic employment is related to this idea of where people were freed. So the lack of mobility from the South to the North, not until the, uh, the um, 50s, um, like late 40s and 50s, this had a, sig a significant impact on economic mobility when you look at the concentration of wealth in the South as compared to the North during this time. Uh, discrimination in hiring, again, we look at it for today, but we also have to think about the legacy of discrimination in hiring and how that was linked to even the violence uh, with Black workers. There's been studies that look at lynching. We think about lynching as only being related to hate, uh, but uh, several studies of economists have shown the role of lynching as it relates to uh, economic uh, opportunity. When economic opportunity was restricted, uh, then lynchings increased. So this idea about economic conditions really controlling some of these outcomes, I think, is particularly important when we look at employment. A uh, limited political power with uh, the Voting Rights Act. And then federal housing policy and segregation in American cities, all of these factors can relate to what's happening today. Uh, next slide. In part of this, when we think about land and loss, um, there's been a, a much discussion currently about black farmers and the loss of, of land. Uh, and the financial loss of land, if we look at an estimate as far as dollars, it totaled $3.7 billion in today's dollars. So we can't take this extraction of wealth, we can't separate it from food insecurity or the racial gap that we see today. Next slide. So um, as was mentioned, this widening and gap, and uh, I won't talk a lot about COVID since it's been mentioned, but this loss can have significant economic impacts and also mental health impacts on well-being when you experience this loss through things like incarceration, disease, and violence. And COVID is a good example of that. Uh, next. So to address the racial uh, gap in food insecurity, we have to think of food assistance programs, again, how people can survive today. And our food assistance programs and expansion of those programs can help people survive today.
Uh, but we also have to think and move beyond food assistance policies to look at policies overall that foster economic, social, psychological, and physical well-being within communities that have been disproportionately impacted. Um, some of these uh, efforts are really happening right now when we think about a strategic plan to create an infrastructure to tackle racial inequity or to stimulate land and home ownership, uh, other things like savings and retirement, and then provide funding for mental health support and cultural restoration, which I think is an area that we have not focused on as much. Uh, next slide. So Fannie Lou Hamer, and I'm just gonna close uh, with this quote, um, but I wanna turn it over to Alberto Gonzalez, single senior project manager for health uh, policy with UNITOS uh, US. But Fannie Lou Hamer said, if you give a hungry man food, he will eat, but if you give him land, he will grow his own food. Uh, next slide. Thank you, next slide. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, FRAC, for inviting Unidos US to be part of this important webinar today to discuss hunger, poverty, COVID-19, and the role that federal nutrition programs can play to address the, the, the inequities that we're seeing play out today. And thank you again, um, uh, Dr. Odoms Young, for your, for your research and your work. Next slide, please. For those who may not be familiar with Unidos US, uh, you may have known us by our former name, the National Council of La Raza. Now over 50 years old, we remain the nation's largest Latino civil rights and advocacy organization, working to increase opportunities for the nation's nearly 60 million Latinos. We have a nationwide network of nearly 300 community-based affiliates across the country that directly serve the Latino community, including many who help Latino families enroll in federal nutrition programs, including SNAP. We believe that all children and families should have the opportunity and ability to be healthy, no matter where they live, how much they earn or where they were born. However, too many Latino children are, are lacking the critical building blocks for good health, including consistent access to affordable and nutritious food. That is why Unidos US in partnership with our affiliates have played a long time role advocating for policies to reduce food insecurity. And this is even more important in our current environment of increased hunger among America's children and families. We reached a grim milestone this week of 670,000 deaths from COVID. And a month ago, or months ago, we learned about the drop in the nation's life expectancy by a full year. And Black Americans and Latinos experienced the biggest drops at three and 2.9 years, respectively. These figures speak to volumes to the sheer scale of suffering our communities are experiencing and expose long-term inequities in accessing healthcare, healthy food, and in economic supports. Latinas were in a more precarious position going into this pandemic. Close to one in 10 Latino children were uninsured and nearly one in six lived in a food insecure household. And Latinos remain more likely to live in poverty than other groups. While Latino children are 26% of the US, make up 26% of all US children, they comprise about 41% of all children living in poverty. The pandemic has exacerbated the situation for Latino children, particularly for those living in mixed status households who continue to be left behind out of COVID relief. Of the nearly 6 million American children who are estimated to live in mixed immigrant status homes, 4.5 million are thought to be Latino. Our nation cannot fully recover from this pandemic without ensuring that everyone, including all Latino children and families, have equitable access to food assistance and economic supports. Next slide, please. For far too long, food insecurity has been a pressing issue among Latino children and families, and the pandemic has only exacerbated the situation in our community. Prior to COVID, the national food insecurity rate in 2019 was its lowest in 20 years, even though about one in six Latinos still reported food insecurity. And as was mentioned earlier, the recently released report by USDA in 2020, 17.2% of Latino households were food insecure, compared to 7.1% of non-Hispanic white households. And consistently since the start of the pandemic, census data show that 20% of Latino families report their households sometimes or often did not have sufficient food in the past seven days. 
And food insufficiency has been gradually decreasing for the average American family. And although COVID-19 relief measures, such as increased SNAP benefits and the expansion of, the, of child tax credits has reduced food insecurity from its peak, there's still nutrition gaps in place and between Latino families and the average American families. Next slide, please. And we're seeing this nutrition gap widen because Latino families face multiple systemic and structural barriers to SNAP participation, including eligibility restrictions, high poverty rates, limited language access services, and inadequate community outreach. Policies stemming from 1996 welfare reform continue to restrict many Latinos from accessing food assistance. For example, lawfully present adults are subject to a five-year bar to participate in SNAP. And while the vast majority of Latino children are citizens, more than half live in mixed immigrant status households. Recent immigration policies such as public charge have contributed to a 10% decrease in eligible SNAP enrollment and a concurrent increase in child food insecurity among immigrant families. And moreover, nearly 30% of Latinos in mixed status households report avoiding safety net programs for which they are eligible, such as SNAP, for fear of impacting their or their loved one's immigration status. And despite the Biden administration's action to reverse Trump's public charge rule, confusion surrounding its status remains in the Latino community. In addition, limited access to and availability of culturally responsive and linguistically appropriate information has kept many Latinos unaware about their eligibility for federal nutrition programs. Limited access to computers, low levels of computer literacy, and limited access to high-speed internet have also increased barriers to food assistance for Latinos, especially during, during this pandemic. When many local SNAP offices closed due to the pandemic, many Latino families had trouble accessing or using a computer to complete SNAP applications online, or had difficulty using a state's complex online portal system to upload documents for SNAP applications. Our affiliates who provide direct enrollment assistance to the Latino community for federal nutrition programs report that many state and local food distribution sites are inaccessible at public transit. Many of these sites require a car to pick up food to minimize COVID exposure, leaving out families without vehicles. In addition, the hours of operation at many food distribution sites are inconvenient for farm workers, many of whom are Latino who work long hours and are unable to pick up food. These barriers may explain why an estimated 4 million Latinos nationwide who are eligible for SNAP do not participate in the program. And these barriers contribute significantly to leaving Latino children particularly vulnerable to food insecurity, leading to poor health outcomes. Next slide, please. We have the opportunity now to write a new playbook on fighting hunger, one that guarantees all people have equitable access to nutritious food. The pandemic provides an opportunity for us to take bold, targeted actions to eliminate persistent inequitable access to healthy food. Firstly, we can strengthen nutrition assistance by expanding community eligibility provision access to better reach children in high poverty districts. CEP allows schools in high poverty areas to provide meals to all low-income students at no cost. More than 8 million Latino children attend high poverty schools in which at least 40% of students are certified to receive free or reduced price school meals. As we saw throughout the pandemic, children's nutrition needs do not change when schools are closed, including during the summer months. Expanding summer EBT will ensure that low-income Latino children have consistent access to healthy food. With higher Latino child participation rates in Medicaid than in other programs like SNAP, expanding direct certification to Medicaid will ensure that many eligible food insecure Latino children are able to access nutritious food. Policymakers must step up to not only address the urgent needs of families now, but also to bolster future benefits by taking immediate action to remove barriers and increase participation in food assistance programs. And according to Unidos US's recent poll, it's also what Latino parents want want to see Congress do to help them make ends meet for their children and their families. Next slide, please. Unidos US recently conducted a poll in August among Latino parents with children under 18 and younger to learn about the barriers for the community to receive a COVID-19 vaccine, which remains the strongest and most critical response against the risks of COVID-19. 
The poll also included several questions to better understand how federal programs such as school meals and SNAP reached Latino parents during the pandemic. Data from our recent poll shows that shows the extent to which federal nutrition programs benefited Latino families and the additional need for food assistance to help Latino parents fully recover from the pandemic. Certainly, the Biden administration made historic investments under the American Rescue Plan Act to help millions, including Latinos, get vaccinated, work, pay their bills, and feed themselves and their children. And our poll shows that over the past year, 85% of Latino parents received health and economic supports from the federal government, including stimulus payments, food assistance, SNAP benefits, unemployment benefits, and Medicaid. An overwhelming number of these parents found that these programs made a big difference in helping their family make ends meet and stay healthy during COVID. And given their concerns and experience with COVID, Latino parents also want Congress to make additional investments in COVID relief. More than eight in 10 support increasing access to free school meals and nearly three in four support expanding and increasing SNAP benefits. Next slide, please. And Latino parents' support for these additional investments con is consistent across states. We see here broad support for these programs for these additional investments that reflect Latino families living in Arizona, Texas, California, and Florida. And this is a, a, a critically important slide because you see the range of, of support and additional need uh, given the experiences that Latino families had and, and, and the additional supports they, they want Congress to take on in order to support themselves and their families during this pandemic. The bold investments today that strengthen and protect nutrition assistance programs will ensure that all children, including Latinos, have access to a basic human need and an opportunity for a healthy future. Thank you again, and I will turn it over to Luis for the remainder of the webinar. Luis? Thank you so much, Alberto and uh, Angela, for those excellent uh, presentations and some really interesting thinking. Um, so I'm gonna uh, get, uh, th there's some questions that, that have come in through the Q&A, and so uh, I encourage you to uh, continue to, uh, to populate that uh, uh, with your questions. Um, so I'll start out with this one for both Angela and Alberto. Uh, so you you both anchor your work in in stories, uh, Alberta through your advocacy in the network, and and Dr. Odom Jung through your qualitative research. Um, could could you share with us a story that illustrates kind of the the, the this uh, feedback cycle that we've seen between hunger and poverty, and uh, what are uh, some of the uh, the unique hardships uh, that we're seeing now during the pandemic? Uh, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Odom Jung, we'll start with you. Thanks so much. I think um, we've been working really closely with communities. Uh, and I also, uh, when Alberto mentioned uh, welfare reform, some of the first work that I did was right after welfare reform, doing a three study ethnography in the homes of families that um, were transitioning from welfare to work. And I think when we look at just across uh, sort of from then to now, it's important to understand that families are really resilient in spite of some of the challenges that they face. And many families are facing significant hardship. I think it's the economic hardship, it's the psychological hardship, and then also death. Uh, people are losing potential breadwinners in a household, uh, parents, and so part of uh, you know, thinking more about how we can support families. And I see a lot of community-based organizations also working very hard. Uh, so when I think about the stories of community, uh, I really just want to highlight how communities have been particularly resilient, even though the hardship has persisted, not only with COVID, but over many years. Alberta? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. So, you know, Latinos have, uh, as we discussed, for have experienced persistent barriers to access to federal nutrition programs. And especially at this time when Latinos make up a large number of essential workers who don't have 
uh, jobs that that provide uh, health insurance, who don't who who work in low wage positions, who don't have um, you know oppor- access to these critical supports and have these barriers that they have to encounter. And and you know I, I think the the experience that Latino parents specifically have ex- have faced this past year has has been profound. And we we see that in the poll that we just released, where you know Latino parents had. Uh, Family members that 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 were impacted by COVID, some that cl- close loved ones that lost their lives to COVID, and so it's it's been a profound uh, experience for many many families, and and it and it speaks to the additional needs for for supports uh, to keep themselves and their children healthy. You know, the other thing I wanted to mention is that before the the pandemic hit, Latinos were still recovering from the Great Recession. Um, you know, in the, in the decade following the Great Recession, the Latino unemployment uh, dropped to pre-recession levels. But at the same time, there was a, a 67% increase in Latinos who were working part-time jobs who wanted full-time work. And as, as this happened, the, the, the pandemic hit the nation and just further pushed the Latino community behind and widened nutrition gaps, increased, they contributed to, to uh, widening health inequities. We know that you know, Latino children uh, continue to remain uh, more more likely to be uninsured than non-Hispanic white children, particularly in, in certain states where uh, Medicaid expansion has not taken place. So there are, uh, you know, the, the pandemic hit at a time when Latinos, particularly children and families were in a vulnerable position. And th- that speaks to the need for additional investments, bold investments to uh, support the community to fully recover from from this pandemic. Terrific, uh, thanks both, and um, and and some questions uh, about the programs uh, uh, themselves. Uh, they've uh, we have clear evidence that they've um, uh, they've been uh, key to preventing a spike in hunger and poverty. Uh, so one one could. Uh, Say you know, that uh, hunger and poverty is is a political choice. Um, so some of the questions um, folks are 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 posing are: uh, What can Congress, the administration, and communities do uh, to uh, support and strengthen these programs uh, to reduce hunger and poverty? Um, uh, Dr. Odom Jung, uh, we'll start with you. I think we can do a few things. One is that, uh, and we look at our BIPOC uh, food providers, our pantries and local communities have been have been the hardest hit. Uh, some of our urban farms, they have responded. I see uh, WIC staff in the chat. Uh, we work with a lot of WIC sites and through the waivers and, um, but we see WIC staff showing up and making sure that communities are served. Um, so I think communities can really continue to work collaboratively uh, and then also advocate, advocate for those changes that are needed. I see even a comment in the Q&A uh, from J- Jim Krieger about data. Uh, part of thinking about we, we can't understand what we don't have federal data to document. And so it's so important. I know that that's a push about disaggregation of data and making sure that we highlight. Uh, So I think community organizations can really advocate for what's needed to push racial equity. Uh, And and I apologize a lot of times when I show up with presentations and, and I don't have data around indigenous people. That is really unjust. Um, and that's cultural violence. And so it's important that our communities work together to advocate, uh, to make sure that the community, the frontline folks are supported, but also we look at other types of policies that can be put in place. Thanks, Alberto. Yeah, I, I agree. There is a need to strengthen data collection and reporting to truly understand the full extent to which COVID has impacted our communities to better identify targeted policy solutions to close coverage gaps, to close vaccination gaps, to close meal gaps. And so that, that should be central to uh, to the development of policies that, that respond to the needs of our of our communities. And I think currently, just given the environment that we're in, 
with uh, the federal level where there is an opportunity to make bold investments in, in federal nutrition programs, certainly, certainly strengthening uh, and expanding the community el eligibility provision to better reach uh, children in high poverty districts, expanding the summer EBT program. I saw that uh, someone mentioned in the comments, uh, PEBT, um, you know, we, our affiliates do SNAP and, and PEBT enrollment work. And there was a story that one of our affiliates shared in Texas in Dallas, where this family was, was struggling. Uh, this, this mom was struggling to take care of her kids and she found out about PEBT and was able to, uh, to receive benefits to pay for her, her food for her family. And she was, she was crying at the office. And so I think it really speaks to the extent that these programs um, that, that reach Latinos throughout the year are so crucial at this time. Um, and then in terms of the, the data points, you know, expanding direct certification to Medicaid using Medicaid data uh, is, is sort of another way to ensure that Latinos who are eligible for different uh, programs, uh, health coverage and other economic supports programs are able to get, to get the resources they need to put food on the table at this time. Uh, so, and at, at the federal level, or at the administrative level, um, I'll just mention that more awareness is needed around the uh, tri-agency guidance. We know that there is a lot of confusion around immigrant eligibility for programs such as SNAP. And so wanting to make sure that, that different SNAP agencies and, and um, organizations that conduct SNAP enrollment are aware about the current status of the public charge rule, that they're aware about families that are eligible for or SNAP programs and, and benefits. That way, uh, that's that's a key step to ensure that we reverse the chilling effect that was created by Trump's public charge rule. Terrific. Uh, th thank you both. Um, some other questions uh, th that have kind of popped up in, in the chat um, have to do with the long view, right? So uh, we're, we're here in COVID, we're dealing with these issues right away. Um, and we know that some of the racial disparities in food insecurity uh, that, 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 uh, that have increased in 2020 speak to a variety of issues that, that, that have been around for a long time. Uh, Dr. Adams, you, you, showed, you showed that, that great uh, timeline, right, where we have like this small sliver of stuff that, uh, that we kind of can consider, uh, you know, recent history compared to what's been going on uh, for a long time. Um, uh, and, and, and maybe, uh, and, and, and Alberta, I'd welcome your thoughts too, but uh, Dr. Omsiong, uh, first over to you. What are some examples of some fundamental shifts you, you uh, can see that might be needed to address, you know, some of the root causes of hunger? So I think, um, you know, some of the investment, you know, I mentioned the data and I think it's important when we talk about documenting uh, food insecurity in indigenous populations, because there's a lot of local studies, both that show um, the impact of COVID has been quite significant and the impact of food insecurity uh, on tribal communities has been significant. And I think one of the things when we look at policies of, uh, and I mentioned this in my talk, because one is policies that bring wealth. So what is what kind of policies bring wealth? Uh, land policies, housing uh, policies, um, policies that focus on savings. There's been a policy about baby bonds that's been proposed. So I think it's important that we focus on the, the food insecurity policies. I mean, um, the food assistance policies. You can't really get to the long-term policies unless you make sure that people are not experiencing hunger today. That's where our core programs have been so critical in making sure that people don't experience hunger. And with COVID, it's been pretty significant and the programs have responded. But the long-term have to deal with some of those root causes of the racial wealth gap and poverty. And many of those policies are difficult because as food folks, we don't normally think about these policies. And so how do we look at um, particularly those land policies? There's been some kind of in the food and agricultural space, but the way that most people build wealth in the United States is through land and housing, uh, through employment, wage equity, 
Um, and we have to also look at, and we have wage inequity across all levels, college debt. That's uh, an issue that uh, can, has continued to keep people in poverty and has had an economic, negative economic impact uh, on communities. Um, Alberto, over to you. Any, uh, what are you seeing in terms of uh, kind of some some of the uh, you know fundamental shifts that 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 need to happen? Yeah, you know, um, there as I mentioned earlier, there's restrictions for immigrants to access uh, certain benefits, and that that's been a, a detriment, and it's impacted access to nutrition programs for the community. Um, we know that there is a, a, a five-year bar for uh, adult, immigrant adults to access SNAP benefits. And there are certain states that have created their own state uh, SNAP programs to, to reach immigrant families in their communities and in their states. Uh, but certainly the, the existing restrictions on, on based on immigration status uh, you know, are, are preventing the uh, investments that have been made to address COVID's impact from fully reaching every member of the Latino community. And so it's, it's crucial that, uh, that as we continue to advocate for uh, in, increased investments in different federal nutrition programs, that we also look to, um, to reducing barriers to these programs due to immigration status. And given that many Latino children live in mixed immigrant status households, it's, 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 it's crucial in order to ensure that all families are able to put food on the table, are able to feed their children, especially as we're all navigating this, this pandemic. Terrific, thank you. Um, and, and some other questions uh, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from our audience. Um, what, one question about, uh, 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 for, uh, for, either, uh, for either of our panelists, um, uh, what do we see in terms of the connection between uh, some of the programs and efforts to minimize the impact of over-policing over -policing and crime prevention? And um, uh, any, any, any examples or thoughts panelists might have on, 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 that, uh, on that intersection? I think um, one thing uh, uh, one one thing that that we've been uh, doing here at FRAC uh, is uh, we've also we've, we uh, in in the current um, in, in in the current uh, uh, reconciliation package uh, there is an effort to um, uh, to uh, 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 to get rid of the uh, uh, ban uh, uh, of, of people who are coming out of the correctional. Uh, system on, on SNAP. Uh, it, it's a process where uh, it, it's just like one of those things, uh, like like some of the uh, some of the harmful rules we've seen in terms of uh, work requirements that kind of keep perpetuating the, the, the cycle and, and kind of keep it hard uh, for people uh, to uh, to develop uh, the agency uh, that um, uh, that uh, that will that will that will get them a, um, out of poverty. Uh, it, it's 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 a state by state thing right now, uh, and uh, so you know we're looking at uh, eliminating uh, that ban. It's something uh, we're we're actually uh, quite uh, quite excited about. But um, that is uh, uh, that's something uh, that's something we're uh, we're pressing forward. Uh, I'll pause there if there if our panelists want to add anything more to that. If not, I can go to uh, to our next question. I was going to just add quickly, I think when you look at developing, uh, and for example, right now we have a food policy equity council. I uh, believe that a lot of the food focus equity programs can also serve as a model for more broad action. One, once you start bringing together people in coalitions, you can talk about issues. I know, for example, SNAP Ed is really involved in a lot of coalition building as it relates to nutrition. But when mm -hmm. we look at whole family solutions, over-policing can be one of those solutions that when you bring people to the table and they start talking about improving the lives of families, we can think more holistically. That may not be our wheelhouse, but we can partner with others that are thinking about how do we improve outcomes overall? We've um, traditionally been siloed 
But now I think we have such an opportunity to really think more holistically and over policing, even though it may not be an issue that we always focus on, over policing also impacts people's access to food retail. It can impact way, the way people engage and walk around the community. So those holistic solutions through coalition building and community organizing in the nutrition space can also help overall. I, yeah, I would build on that and just emphasize the, important, the importance of leveraging trusted messengers to get the word out about SNAP, to raise awareness about other food assistance programs. They're, you know, just given the environment that families are in, particularly within the Latino community, it's, it's, it's the fear around the, the virus, but also um, recovering from years of, of anti-immigrant climate. And so it's, it's so key to leverage and, and invest in trusted me messengers, community-based organizations uh, to really uh, reach um, community members where there are and provide them with resources and education um, uh, on, on the tools they, they have available to respond to the needs in their, in their families. Fantastic. Uh, th uh, thank you both. Um, and then uh, I think uh, I see we're, we're, we're coming up on time, but uh, uh, there was a, a great question in the chat about uh, what people can do. And so we have uh, we have a couple links on, on the slide that, that, that people can see uh, in terms in terms of, uh, of further actions. But uh, when, uh, when when looking at uh, you know we uh, we can uh, engage engaging from the kind of language I'm seeing in the chat I, I see we, we have a lot of we have a lot of uh, uh, advocates and, and activists and people who, uh, who who are who are anxious to get involved um, um, any other any other thoughts on, on on how folks can can help engage uh, in this uh, in, in order to take advantage of uh, the current political climate the current um, uh, uh, societal uh, uh, pivot point that uh, I think we've all been, uh, uh, you know, trying to get our, our our head and our hands around about that. That this feels like like a like a, a pivotal time for our, for our country and, and and for folks to be able to to make some uh, make some important changes. So uh, just maybe a, a couple of final last thoughts from our panel uh, on that. Yeah, I I would um, I would direct folks to FRAC's website, to Unidos US's website for information on on food insecurity. Uh, we have um, you know we we, we have our, our our priorities for budget reconciliation, which is an opportunity to uh, increase investments in these critical supports. So go to UnidosUS.org. We also have state specific fact sheets for Florida and Texas that includes some. Uh, policy solutions to address at the state level. We held, we've held a series of roundtables in Florida and Texas with our affiliates, and we have those on our website as well with some state-specific uh, state strategies to address food insecurity for the community at, at the state level. And I, um, I know we only have like two minutes, but I think one is awareness. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, getting out of your silo uh, now there's more research that talks about the determinants of the determinants. And so it's important that we understand what are those determinants and drivers, uh, and then figuring out how we can, for the researchers in the room, think more about theoretical foundations for some of the drivers of this work. And then I think for the advocates, how do you continue to align with others and thanks for the information in the chat. I think it's sharing resources is key. So the more aware we are, and then um, the more that we are willing to get out of our silos, then I think that's where we really can see significant action. Terrific. Well, um, I think we're uh, just about at time. And uh, uh, again, I just uh, wanted to give uh, a huge thanks to uh, Allison, uh, Dr. Odoms Young, uh, Alberto, uh, thank you so much uh, for for joining us today. Uh, and and as we as we closed up, uh, uh, there are resources uh, uh, on our websites. We encourage people uh, to come uh, visit and, uh, and and connect with us. Uh, in, on, on, on as you see on the slide, uh, and we can continue having uh, this conversation. Uh, this this should not be the uh, 
the end of it by 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 any stretch. There's a tremendous uh, uh, good stuff that we can do. Uh, a lot uh, a lot of people are are depending on uh, on these programs and uh, depending on uh, some significant change that we want to see uh, come out of of the uh, of the COVID pandemic and uh, and after hundreds of years, really, of, of, of systemic injustice. This is uh, this is a time for us to make some important change. So uh, thank you all so much again. And uh, we wish you all uh, health and safety and, uh, and a good rest of your day. Take care. Okay, we'd like to thank you all for joining us today and for your interesting questions. We'd also like to thank our speakers for sharing their expertise. We hope you have a great afternoon.